Welcome to the Metal Voice for the first time. Tom Hunting, drummer extraordinaire for Exodus. <laughs> What's going on, Tom? Thanks, dude. Um, nice to meet you. Nice Good to, meet to be you on too. with you. Thank you very much. Uh, Zetro's been on. Gary's been on many times, but this is the first time you're on the show. Very exciting. My North pleasure. American North American tour is going to happen. The battle of 24, 2024, I guess. North American tour starting November the 2nd in Tampa, going all the way to December. Exodus is headlining. New live album, British Disaster uh, from 89, live in Astoria, right? Or uh, the Astoria. I'm not sure how they pronounce it there, but whatever. Um, but first things first. Paul I Diano. Know. Paul Diano. Paul Diano. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, the, those those first two albums, like, changed, changed my drumming style, my life musically. And, you know, we were playing that stuff in backyards when we were barely teenagers. Backyard kegger parties. And um, people thought Running Free was, a, was an Exodus original. <laughs> Sorry, we didn't write that one. But it, it, funny, boy. funny thing when, when Paul was in his solo band, I believe it was in Battle Zone. I think they did a showcase, or maybe it was Killers. They did a showcase, and they played probably like Phantom or something. And the execs thought that was an original as well. <laughs> yeah, but go ahead, go ahead. Tell me, tell me your thoughts we, about Paul Down on those first two albums. Go right ahead. We gotta, we gotta pay respect here. Um, our friend bought that record just because of the picture. And there was yeah. an import record store in Berkeley. I think he bought it from uh, Rasputin's or something. But anyway, he brought it home and we burned it up. It was just so good and so groundbreaking. And, you know, um, I, I loved Paul Diano. I thought, I thought he, was, he, was, he was a punk rock singer that they molded into a metal singer. And they just, they invented something, you know, together. And Clive... Clive Burr was in that band too. He's one of my biggest influences. And, you know, uh, they Did, fired Paul, they fired yeah. Clive. And I'm like, what the hell? You know, not that I didn't love Number of the Beast and, and all the music that came after that, but, you know, it's it was uh, tough to swallow, you know, when they let him go. I was like, how can they, you know, possibly... And they just did something different, you know. Yeah. They they went um, less punky, more you know, more mainstream. But you know, you hear some of those some of those riffs that could have been on on Killers, the riffs on the first album that could have been on Killers or Number of the Beast, you know. Did do you think? Quick question: Do you think that if they carried on one more album with Paul, it, they would have still would have been as successful i don't know if they would have been as huge but number of the beast still would have been an amazing record yeah you know um because they were you know they were getting into produ more production then and you know the songs themselves were strong on that record i mean end to end um clive's last album too yeah um, yeah 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 but um that sucks I, I think the band would have grown, but of course it would have never went over the top like they did, right? I mean, you needed some. I think it would have grown too, but you know, they they got kind of a, you know, I think a power metalish singer, and it yeah. and it worked. It worked. It worked with with those kind of riffs, and you know, it kind of exploded. You know, I'll end with this. I I got into Iron Maiden when Paul was in the band. Mm -hmm. Me too. And I, had the, and I had the first three. And then when he was let go, I was like, what? What have you done to my band? Why on earth would you let him go? People who didn't start liking the band when Paul was there don't understand that. They just yeah. don't, they, they can't comprehend it. It was big, a big cult sort of following, you know, it's like, yeah. Peter, Gabriel, like Peter Gabriel leaving Genesis. People still can't get over that, right? So. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um. Funny story. One more thing about Iron Maiden is um, I played an Angel Witch for like that long for a minute. Oh yeah, yeah. and uh, Angel Witch and Iron Maiden <clears throat> both kind of uh, they played the same showcase gig, and the gig was actually for Angel Witch. And Angel Witch went on stage drunk, so I'm told, and um, 
they just were terrible. And <laughs> Iron Maiden crushed. And they got signed. <laughs> um, you played also with Battlezone, right? Battlezone played with you guys a few gigs. Is that what it was? Yeah, I remember day? we did a show with them in Arizona. It was years years ago, and it was probably 86-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were they were great. The, the, I remember the, the the tour manager really liked us too. He was a really nice guy. I can't remember his name, but you know, I seem to remember us like fanboying the shit out of Paul Diano. You know, <laughs> yeah, and a great band, Battlezone. Great band. I wish I saw them on tour. I don't. It had know. to be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, let's go. To, let's move on. Let's actually tell me about your health. I'm doing good. You're Everything doing good. Impressive. I'm doing good. You know that they, they scam me quite often, and um, I just got one uh, September. I had one, and you know, I was feeling kind of worn down, and I thought, uh, you know, I get what I call scanxiety whenever they yeah. whenever they take pictures in there, and they they didn't see anything. So if they they take the pictures and they give me all the blood work and stuff, and if they don't see anything, I just go live my life. You know. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I kind of, I have that same fear. I had some health issues and um, you go for a blood test, you're going, oh my God, you go for a scan, you go, oh my God, what, what are the results? So, I mean, it's, it, there is that scan anxiety, right? Uh, or, scan anxiety. Or, yeah. It's a, scan real anxiety. Thing. Um, it's a real thing. We, I got the results, you know, cause you can get them on your app. My, I get my, on my, yeah, my chart yeah. app sure, before sure. the doc, before I even meet with the doctor and he can tell me like, I've, had so many of those scans now i know how to read that stuff so i know if it says you know you know um pancreas not remarkable liver <laughs> not remarkable brain not remarkable if your brain's not remarkable on one of those tests you're doing all right i'm like yeah. remarkable unremarkable what's going on here just tell me if it's good or not i don't understand the language <laughs> on any other kind of test you would be a loser but on that one you're winning <laughs> that's right that's right all right let's let's get into exodus let's go let's okay. go quickly in the back we know okay. there's a live album we know there's a tour so we're just here just chit-chatting talking a little okay. bit about the history um let's go back in time for the people who don't understand exodus was there at the beginning of the thrash movement in the bay area right yeah uh, kirk hammett was in the band a lot of people don't even remember this all of the huge yeah. metallica fans today what was what was the I always wondered this. I always wanted to ask this. I never asked Gary this, but maybe he wasn't there. What was the, the conversation like when, you know, Kirk's in the band for a few years, right? And he goes, listen, guys, I'm going to go join this other band. But I mean, you guys are kind of making waves, right? And and now he's going off to Metallica. They, they haven't been signed yet. Yeah. But like, I mean, what was the discussion like? What was, what was that feeling like back then? Um, well, by that time we had done like probably – five or six gigs maybe more with metallica because they were you know they were hustling in the bay area they weren't yeah. they weren't actually actual bay area residents at that point but mm -hmm. um that was when they got cliff um that they became full-time bay area but i i was happy for him you know i knew i knew it was gonna we could kind of see that you know that they were going to be a great band and it was a good opportunity for him. So I would, I would never stand in the way and try to, please don't go, you know. But it, There must have been a little bit of him. that in the back. You're, you know, you're happy I mean, for him but at the same time, right? Yeah, of course, you know. And um, of course, yeah, because we were, we were on, a, on a trajectory too, but like on a Bay Area trajectory. They were getting in new halls and going to the East Coast and just like, yeah. you know, whatever be damned. And, you know... And they kick the door down for all the all the rest of us. You know? It's true. It's true. So in a way, him leaving was probably the best decision for everyone, right? In that totally. Area, and I think, you know, in that moment, it was important for me to be supportive of him doing that because, you know, I knew he was replacing, you know, a well, well liked guitarist, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Um, and a founding member of the band. And like, you know, I, I, yeah, I knew it wasn't going to be easy for him. Yeah. yeah. So, but he just went in and crushed it, you know. Kirk's such a just a just a wonderful person and a nice human being. Like it's hard not to get caught up into the 
the yeah. the good energy that comes off of that guy. Yeah. And see he's that. still the same, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I, I should also ask you, are you guys working on any music? What's the trajectory on the music? How's that? Uh, the music's going to come together really fast and it's really awesome. We, we worked, um, we worked last March, April and a little bit in May and, um, got the nucleus for a bunch of songs basically flip flop some of the beats on some songs that happens, you know, sometimes. And, um, so I have a lot of material to, to work with. We're, we're, um, after this tour, we're going to woodshed. We'll probably get together in my studio here. I'm, I'm in Northern California. Yeah. We're, um, we're probably going to work, work through the end of December and then into January. So we'll have two months and we already have the nucleus of a bunch of great songs. So, are, are you going to be contributing? Are you going to be huh? contributing musically to it? W w the exception, okay, drums, it's obvious, right? But yeah. about some writing or songs or lyrics? Well, I wrote one, the lyrics to one, The Years of Death and Dying on the last record. Mm -hmm. And um, it turned out to be a really great song. So, like, I think between that and the journey with the cancer and stuff, like, it awoke something in me. Like, you know, so I got notepads with scribbles, like, a whole bunch of stuff. I need to um, to like formulate them into songs, <laughs> but I got a lot of words and stuff. And the drums are part of the music. What do you mean? Well, yeah, they are. But you know what I'm saying? Outside of the drums, I meant to say outside of the drums. Yeah, I'm gonna try to write some. You know, and um, yeah, it's really fun, and um, I I really enjoy like lyric writing. It's great. Where, could, where do you just, where? Where do you see Go the ahead. band going musically next album? Is it is it just is it the same old Exodus with some more great songs, or are you just gonna try to vent veer off into maybe other directions or what's sort of the plan? I really couldn't tell you. Like, I mean there there could be some experimental stuff and it all happens organically and kind of in the moment, you know. I thought mm -hmm. Blood In Blood Out was kind of like a good old thrash album. Um Persona non grata was a little more, mm, yeah, it was like a little more meaty, a little more dark, dark, goes to some dark places. All the music we made with Dukes was a little more progressive and went to dark places. Um, and I like that stuff too. So I think it'll be a little bit of everything. And we got a bunch of covers in the bag too that um, we recorded in the last sessions mm -hmm. for Persona non grata. And we'll probably do some of those too. And just, just obscure B-side punk stuff and you know okay. fun stuff all right um rob dukes any regrets or be his his era is there any regrets that you said no we should have done this instead of that um i mean there's always there's always like would have could have showed us you know and that goes for you know teams that lose games um bands that part ways with members you know um and I'm super glad that we're, you know, tight again. And I really love it when he comes out and jams with us. And that era of music, like, I was out of the band and they did Shovel. And then I came back and um, we did both of the Atrocity albums with Dukes. And that music was like, ugh, it was fun. It was dark. And like, I felt, I felt like it was fresh and it was different, you know? Um, and like Gary was listening to a lot of um, more, I guess not prog metal, but I don't know that dark stuff he listens to. When I'm when I'm at home, I listen to more you know soul music and things like that. Um, but I, I get a big enough dose of doing metal. There's always regrets, <laughs> but I think I think you grow from them, and you you know you you um you learn from it. Were there any fork in the roads in the career of Exodus? coming out of the gate with three, four, five great albums. And then I'm not sure where the band broke up. Could, could something been avoided at the time? We were, we were terrible at, you know, business and like, you know, we should have pushed ourselves harder. I think in the earlier days, 
And to be quite honest, you know, as a younger man, you kind of get more caught up in the party of it than, you know, than trying to build it. And, you know, we've had everything. We've had drug addiction. We've had death. And these aren't excuses because, like, those were probably avoidable issues and 100% our own doing and undoing. We never really broke up as a band. I mean, we just... I guess you could say it broke up in 93 after they did Force of Habit. The band like officially broke up then. But later on, like in the 90s, we did a live record with Paul and then we kind of like dropped out for a while. Yeah. We were all like super high and, you know, we 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 were we were more more drug enthusiasts dabbling in music <laughs> than the other way around, you know. <laughs> so, were you actually were you on the live album? Yeah, this disaster live app. So that was right the, before the story. I was at that gig. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I, tell me about uh, that recording. It, it's a pretty decent recording. Um, I would love to. Um, basically, our old manager Tony Isabella called me one day and said, "Hey, I'm cleaning out my storage somewhere out in San Francisco, out by the pier." She's like, I, "I've been having storage out here for years, and I'm cleaning it out." And there's some master tapes in there. The master tapes, she said, there's a live at Astoria, the Astoria Theater in, in London, 89. And also um, Impact is Imminent, the masters of that. Mm. She's like, I've been calling everybody. I called Gary. I called the current man. I can't get anybody to come and get these tapes. I'm like, I'm on my way. So I went and got them. <laughs> and basically, at the time, I was living on a goat ranch in the East Bay area. Yeah. And they sat there and we're like, hey, well, let's do something with these tapes. Let's let's check them out. So we um we made a record out of it. Like just these kind of like these uh tapes that got forgotten about kind of surfaced. Mm -hmm. We were I was 23 when we when we did that show. It was like a world ago, you know? Yeah. And you know, once it was all mixed and produced, it sounded Sounds fantastic. So it does sound fantastic. Yeah. That's one thing about live albums. They can reinvigorate the sort of earlier recordings, right? They just create a new life. But that show is a pretty it's a pretty decent recording. I thought that was like a soundboard or some sort of but you guys actually had a studio there recording back then? Yes, and we all mobile. forgot that there was like a mobile truck behind the behind the venue that was a uh, rolling tape. So Oh, wow. You know. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> All right. Tell me about the set list now that you're coming on tour in North America as headliners. What kind of set list can people expect? I mean, that's a lot of, you know, you got to play what, at least 90 minutes or a little less than 90 minutes, maybe? Yeah, we're, we're, we're kicking around ideas and we're like, I'm actually up north right now working on songs. Kind of like we don't have any set limits. So we can play as long as we want, unless mm -hmm. there's a curfew involved. So we're um, <clears throat> we're rehearsing like some deeper tracks to maybe oh. pull out because we are celebrating that live record. So we might want to go into some of more of the music that was on that one. It hasn't been played for a long time. So I was actually working on those songs before these interview sessions started today. So I can't tell you what the whole thing will be because we haven't figured it out yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be awesome and. You know, we're going to throw in stuff and see, try it and <clears throat> see if it works. And, um, you know, we're headlining on this tour. So, I mean, Metallica can play any of their songs. Like, they'll whip them out live. And, like, so we're, we're, uh, <clears throat> we're striving to celebrate more of the band's catalog since we're headlining on this one. So Yeah, it's pretty cool. Bonded by, by Blood, the album cover. What are what, what what stories have you heard fans tell you over the years of what that picture means to them? That artwork. Oh man, I, I mean when we when when it first came out, people were like sky blue on your album cover. You know, a metal band with a sky blue album cover and you know, we got cartoon babies on the album cover and you know, it's you know, my grandmother was, was around back then and she was proud of me for making a record, but that album cover scared the shit out of her. So, um, that basically mixed reactions, but the album cover was supposed to be something different. 
Yeah. And the record company goes, yeah. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, so we can but we can like put two cartoon babies like splitting at the seam and blood all over the place. Like <laughs> who whose <laughs> idea was that? Sense. Whose idea huh? was the two baby, the two baby connected idea? Who was that? I can't remember who painted it. Was it was a, a Mark DeVito? Um, I don't even remember who did the picture. That was so long ago. I was was it was it like here's the picture? You guys like it, or was it? Can you come up with something like this? You know, sort it of. It all happened very fast after the uh, after the recording was done, and they rejected mm -hmm. our first proposal for an album cover. So, so quickly, quickly, two babies yeah. connected. Uh, the album was done forever before it was out. Everybody had it before it came out, it seemed like. So, all right. Um, all right. Uh, on that note, uh, the North American tour going to start November the 2nd, all the way to December the 7th. There's at least six Canadian dates. I'm in Montreal, Canada, by the way. So, awesome. we got, yeah, yeah. So, we got, we're very excited to see you here. And I'm sure the rest of the North, uh, US, and Canada is as well. Plus a new live album, British Disaster, The Battle of 89, live at the Astoria. Pick it up. I love it. I think it's great. It, the, the quality Thanks, is amazing. Man. And I love the attitude on stage. It really ca captures the band's attitude, which is and especially Gary Holt sounds like he's 12 years old talking on the mic. You want to hear a fast one? Are you sure you want to hear a fast one? Tom. Nice talking with you, buddy. Nice talking with you. And, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing you on tour. Thank you so much. Thanks. Can't wait to come to Canada. Thank you, Jimmy. <laughs>